House and Judiciary Intelligence Committees approved the bill Wednesday granting federal judges greater oversight over the Bush administration's warrantless surveillance program. Rejecting President Bush's request, the bill does not provide retroactive legal immunity to phone and Internet companies that shared information with intelligence officials. President Bush criticized the bill Tuesday and outlined his demands to renew the government's broad eavesdropping authority. The final bill must meet certain criteria. It must give our intelligence professionals the tools and flexibility they need to protect our country. It must keep the intelligence gap firmly closed and ensure that protections intended for the American people are not extended to terrorists overseas who are plotting to harm us. And it must grant liability protection to companies who are facing multi-billion dollar lawsuits only because they are believed to have assisted in the efforts to defend our nation following the 9-11 attacks. Terrorists in faraway lands are plotting and planning new ways to kill Americans. The security of our country and the safety of our citizens depend on learning about their plans. The Protect America Act is a vital tool in stopping the terrorists. And it would be a grave mistake for Congress to weaken this tool. Wednesday's bill updates the Protect America Act that was, that was pushed through Congress in August of this year and is set to expire in February of 2008. Although the bill restores some of the checks and balances removed by the Protect America Act, it also increases other spying powers. It continues the policy of warrantless eavesdropping of overseas communications and increases the period of warrantless emergency surveillance of U.S. residents. Also, the so-called basket or blanket warrants issued by the secret Federal Intelligence Surveillance Court would only need to be reviewed once a year. The American Civil Liberties Union criticized this provision as, quote, not anywhere close to the rigorous privacy safeguards Americans deserve. Charlie Savage is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter from the Boston Globe, has written extensively about President Bush's signing statements and other White House efforts to expand executive branch secrecy and unchecked power. Warrantless wiretapping is one part of this story. Charlie Savage has just published a book charting the means the Bush administration devised to circumvent laws and expand presidential authority. It's called Takeover, the Return of the Imperial Presidency and the Subversion of American Democracy. Joining us now in our firehouse studio, Charlie Savage. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Charlie, you begin in a very dramatic way on September 11, 2001. Tell us about what Dick Cheney was doing. That's right. I, well, I begin with this sort of unusual moment in the midst of the 9-11 attacks in which uh, the military believes that one, at least one more plane is still in the air and hijacked, and they ask Dick Cheney in the bunker beneath the White House whether they should shoot this plane down. And Cheney gives them authority to shoot down uh, United 93, as it were. Now, it turns out that that was a moot point because United 93 had already crashed amid the passenger uprising. They, did, they were looking at an image of where it would be if it were still in the air. Uh, but this shoot-down order became the subject of an intense dispute with the 9-11 Commission because Cheney later told the Commission, and Bush agreed with him, that, that Bush had given Cheney prior authority as the commander-in-chief who actually commands the military to uh, take such an extraordinary step. But the 9-11 Commission looked at all the notes of the people aboard uh, Air Force One and in the bunker, and they looked at all the switchboard logs from the bunker of the military uh, of communications going in and out, and they found no evidence, no documentary evidence that that call existed. And so I used that moment to open this book, Takeover, because it's a very vivid illustration of, first of all, the, the climate, uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, the atmosphere of 9-11, which really helped this push to concentrate more power in the White House, uh, but also Cheney taking command uh, inside the administration, especially in the na national security context, Bush acquiescing to Cheney's point of view, and then their, their administration's effort to control the flow of information about kind of what's happening behind the door, closed doors at and the executive branch. And when they had branch. the 9-11 Commission hearing meeting, uh, the insistence by Cheney and Bush that it not be uh, sworn testimony, that Cheney be f sitting physically directly next to President Bush, and that there be no recording of their statements made about this conversation about whether Bush had given the actual uh, uh, command or whether it was Cheney. That's, that's right. You know, and of course, it, it is, it's a moot point. The planes were down. It doesn't really matter that much. But it's a vivid way of illustrating Cheney's role in the administration 
and therefore getting into the topic of what Cheney used that influence to do. And one of the most important things and one of the most uh, successfully implemented policies of this administration, one that they never talk about and that I think has received uh, scant attention, depending, just depending on how sweeping it is and how successfully they pulled it off, was that he had wanted, when they arrived in office long before 9-11, to use that time in office to reshape American democracy by concentrating more power in the White House, by expanding presidential power, by throwing off checks and balances. This was an agenda that he had with him dating back 30 years to his time in the White House as chief of staff to Gerald Ford in that period after Watergate in Vietnam when Congress was reimposing some checks and balances on the imperial presidency that had grown up during the early Cold War. And Cheney would spend the next 30 years trying to throw that off. Finally, as vice president, the most experienced vice president in history, dealing with one of the least experienced presidents in history, he was in a position to shape this administration's practices and tactics as it went forward, now pushing into eight years, in order to take actions and set precedents across a huge range of, of issues and ways that were going to leave the presidency much stronger than it was when they arrived. And specifically the use of the signing statements, which of course is, was this, the, the subject of much of your reporting. Uh, how did the signing statements uh, fit into this overall uh, policy? The signing statements are one tactic among many, but it's just it's an illustration of how much more aggressive this administration has been than any that came before, and how it's kind of thrown off sort of unofficial constraints of uh, practices of restraint. A signing statement is an official legal document the president issues on the day he signs a bill into law. It consists of instructions to the, his subordinates in the executive branch about how they are to implement the new laws created by a bill. And uh, it becomes controversial when the president says, you will interpret Section 103 as being unconstitutional, because I alone have said it's unconstitutional, and you do what I tell you. And if it's unconstitutional, that means you don't need to enforce it. And where that becomes very controversial is when Section 103 is a check or a balance on the president's own power because then not enforcing that law means not having to obey that law. Now, previous presidents have occasionally used signing statements like this, but President Bush has, issued, has challenged more laws than all previous presidents in American history combined using signing statements. A dramatic escalation of this tactic in what the American Bar Association has said is evolving into kind of a backdoor override-proof line-item veto power, which can really prevent Congress from ever again imposing any new checks on presidential power. Uh, it's just, but it's an extraordinary thing, an extraordinary development in our constitutional law, and yet it's just one of many, many different tactics the administration has used to concentrate more on check power in the White House. Talk about wiretapping, the controversy now, the frustration that people have with the Democrats, supposedly the opposition party, going along with the Republicans. Right, well, the, the background is that after 9-11, as we all know now, Bush uh, approved, gave, gave the military the authority to wiretap phone calls without warrants in defiance of a 1978 law that required warrants for that situation. And he used a very aggressive legal theory about the president's powers as commander-in-chief to bypass laws at his own discretion. Uh, because that program was only legal if that theory were true, that meant that the fact that they did this set a precedent that says that theory is true, and future presidents will be able to cite that precedent when they want to evade any other law that restricts their own authority. Uh, so now going forward, you know, one, of, one of the ways this, this agenda has been able to be so successfully implemented was that there was no resistance from, from Congress. At the very moment, there was this stronger push coming out of the vice president's office to expand it presidential power as an end to itself in any way possible because of one party rule for six years and because of the atmosphere of crisis of 9-11 there was no pushback and that's how the, the ball was moved so far down the field and one of the things that's been very interesting about the last year is now that we have split control of government again and so the question was how is that going to change things and what we've seen from the protect america act in august and the dynamic going forward is that even with split control of government the dynamic is still there congress is just as it was for the first 20 or 30 years of the Cold War, when the original imperial presidency was growing under, under presidents of both parties, by the way, Congress is, again, unwilling to push back against the, the White House's assertion that it needs ever more authority and checks and balances will result in bloodshed. Uh, and so I think going forward, you can see that this dynamic is going to be with us. And of course, with two years from now, we may have one party control of government again, the other party, but that will just sort of 
hurl us further down this path, I think. And this issue of the, of the, the, the president seeking to protect those in the, uh, in the corporate world who go along with this policy, well, first of all, obviously, there was the, the retroactive immunity to the airline companies after 9-1-1 for their failure to act to, to provide a kind of security on their planes, that uh, 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 giving them immunity from any possible lawsuits. And now this effort by the administration to try to provide retroactive immunity to the telecom companies that went along with his uh, surveillance program. Well, I mean, what, what this is be, is because Congress has demonstrated that it, it's really not going to uh, do anything about the basic fact that the president asserted he could bypass a law and then he acted on that assertion, and you know that established he can do that, or whoever else is president in any given moment from now on can do that. The, the one sort of last place where critics of this sort of extraordinary development uh, it could still had some traction was the, the lawsuits against the companies, which had also evidently uh, broken privacy laws by going along with this. But be, so this is by seeking retroactive immunity, it's sort of the last place of closing off. Uh, the possibility of accountability. And accountability for how people use their power is one of the uh, great ways in which the administration has successfully expanded their own